they would make them sit there for five minutes, maybe 10 while singing. And maybe they were spraying them with water or whatever. More guys quit during that five to 10 minute window than anything else. Because here's what they understood. When you're running and you're carrying a log and you're carrying a boat and water's coming over you, sand's all in your thing and you're having to scratch and climb, what's going on in your mind? Do survival, get through, carry my guy, compete, whatever. Your mind is occupied with stuff. Well, here's what they understand. If we just stop occupying your mind with that stuff, your mind has to start supplying its own story. How many more days? What do I have to do? Do I really want this? I could just walk away. This is nice. They're going to ask me to get back in the water. Do I want to get back in the water? Am I ready? What's that going to feel like? And their mind attacked them from the inside. And guys would just get up, walk over, ring the bell. What's up, everybody? Before we get into this episode, we have to give a big shout out to all of our sponsors. Without them, this wouldn't be possible. Are you or your athletes waking up too hot or too cold in the middle of the night? Or are you looking for a sleep tracker option that doesn't involve wearing a ring or a wrist or a watch, something on your body? Then you need to look no further than the company Sleep Me. Sleep Me makes chili pads, which keep your bed cold or warm, depending on what you want. And they also have a tracker that will go underneath that pad, so it will be able to tell how well you slept. When I did a little study on myself with the Aura Ring and with the Sleep Me tracker, they were within 97% of each other, and it was actually pretty astonishing how similar the two were. I love my chili pad. It makes me sleep great. I sleep cold. I actually wake up cold now. I haven't woke up warm in pretty much ever since I've had it. I don't like sleeping on the road because I don't have the ability to use my chili pad. Bunch of former colleagues back at Towson got it. My stepmother got it. Check it out in the link down below. Are you expanding and need more equipment inside your current room? Or are you building a new weight room and you need to get some equipment? You need to look no further than Powerlift. I had Powerlift equipment when I was at Harvard. Iowa and at the University of Maryland. I'm currently utilizing their stuff right now. I'm telling you, Powerlift Strong, Powerlift Made here in America, here in the great state of Iowa, made, manufactured. You have the ability for customization, whether it's on the bench, whether it's on the uh, upholstery, whether it's on the bumpers, across the rack. There are countless options, making sure it's designed to your specific brand. It's Powerlift Made, it's Powerlift Strong, it's not cheap like all the other competitors, and the people in inside of Powerlift are people that you want to be with. Check them out in the link down below. Hawker Dynamic is the best option if you're trying to get any force plate data or if you're trying to collect any isometric mid-thigh pulls. Not only can you do isometric mid-thigh pulls for the lower body, but I call it an isometric mid-thigh pull for your upper body where you're able to do an isometric push-up into something where your back is pushing into a bar and your hands are on the force plate. I utilized Hawkins force plates and Hawkins software when I was at Towson. Still utilize it now when I'm at Goldfinch. If you're using the other competitors, I don't know what you're doing. Hawkins uh, customer service is second to none. Hawkins software and their hardware, again, second to none. Check them out in the link down below. What's up, strength coaches? Welcome back to another episode of the Cheeky Midweeky where we are making strength and conditioning not boring anymore. And this is not going to be boring. We are talking about a topic that a lot of people love discipline toughness and i am just excited to have our guest on today thank you very much we're talking off air he is early in the morning it's eight o'clock for you thank you very much for joining us today brian yeah glad to be here man uh excited to excited to dig in like so digging into your stuff i mean we've never met before but we're very like i preach discipline i'm discipline equals freedom like you don't need your motivation where did all of this start for you? Because, you know, doing a little bit of research on you, you fell in love with football when you were eight, like kind of talk to me about the genesis of how you fell in love with, with discipline instead of motivation. You know, I, you know, it started actually, you know, ironically, um, my love for, um, I would even take it to a higher level because I, I, I did not fall in love with discipline, uh, at least from a from a terminology perspective or philosophically perspective until in all likelihood well after college right um yeah what i from a higher level what i fell in love with really early was behavior skills like i i i i fell in love with that really early and i was i was blessed and benefited my my dad was coached me in football growing up but you know, but my dad ran track at UCLA. Um, he was national champion in high school in the 300 hurdles. Um, you know, he was a he was a he was a fast he was a fast dude. We we always joke, right? That at at some point he was the fastest white dude in America, which <laughs> which, which, which we laugh. And there's some people who are like, you can't say that anymore. It's like, well, listen, I don't I don't know what to tell you, right? He was just fast. he looks like this, and he was you know whatever. But but 
you know, he was, he went to UCLA and he was, you know, if he was here, he would tell you he fell in love really early with, you know, this idea of chasing your personal best PR, right? From a track perspective, very familiar. He was at UCLA and, and, uh, at, during the time of John Wooden and, kind of observed that in the last few years of wooden and he observed that. So he fell in love with that there. And then, and then I, you know, and I share it because, you know, such a big part of, of where this started for me was you know, like all things, right? Like it started, you know, in my environment with what I was around. And I kind of had, I, I would say two real big influences early on. One was my parents got divorced when I was about a year old and I transferred back and forth between them. And, you know, what San Diego and LA and, and I would drive first and then I got to a, a, or, you know, whether they would drive me and drop me off and, you know, classic thing that happens, but they were really different people. And so I had this, I had this experience growing up through no, you know, control of my own of going to these like really different environments back and forth. And they both like were awesome and amazing and loving and all that stuff, but they were, he was a pastor and my mom was not a pastor and, you know, he was, (laughs) you know, he was the rules and the structure and it was tight, right? Like not overbearing military, but tight. And my mom's was loose and worldly. And I want to educate you through experiences and expose you to more things and way less structure. And so I had like this recognition and all this time sort of between this, as I reflect back now, you know, 40 years later that, you know, I, I, I learned that while the environment around me would always fluctuate and the people around me, you know, would, would be different and operate according to different rules. The one thing that was constant was I could choose. I had agency and choice and I could choose how to navigate through whatever environment was in front of me. And of course I didn't have consciousness of this when I was a kid. Right. But looking back, I, it was a huge benefit. I mean, people look at the cost of this stuff. And then the second was when I started playing football, you know, obviously I, I love the game. And then my dad was coaching and, you know, <clears throat> we we worked on the game all the time, but we talked about and we observed all the non physical stuff that affected the game. And it wasn't it wasn't you know he was a pastor, but he didn't preach at me. We just talked about it all the time. And when we review we would review tape together, and and I loved it. It wasn't like a, a, a it wasn't something he was. We always talk about it. Like he's like I never had to make you watch stuff when you were like nine. Like you just loved watching the game. I just did. I I, I can't teach somebody how to love a game, right? Like that that's hard to do, but. But really early on, so I had, a, I had my eye for this was, was tilted then. <clears throat> and then here was my sort of, here was my, you know, well, I was gonna get excited to get on and talk with you because my moment, if you will, of behavior skills <clears throat> and, and discipline sort of came later out of this from my maturation and looking at the world and being like, okay, like discipline is what I want to, what, what I want to house this under. Cause I think it's this, I think it's this skill to shape all these things, um, paired with a couple others, which I'll introduce here in a little bit, but this was my moment, Justin, it was this, when I was in college, I recognized three things. Number one is that we trained about a hundred times harder and more thoroughly in the weight room than we trained to anything in behavior. Oh yeah. We trained every, and, and, and let's, let's put that on the field as well. Okay. Like I was a safety, we would do <clears throat> EDDs and we would do back pedals and we would do tackling drills and we would do, you know, we would train the exact position of your hands on the power clean and your depth of your squad. And then when it was like, it was, da, da, da. and then when it came time for discipline, trust, collaboration, accountability, difficult conversations, they just yelled. They didn't teach you anything. Oh. And Respectfully, I love working out. I love this. Respectfully, the human mind and behavior patterns of just one person are infinitely more complex than whatever it takes to get somebody to add 75 pounds on their squat. And so like, I'm going to be talking to the UW coaches clinic today. I had a recognition, strong bodies with weak minds get beat. Fast players with slow minds get beat. Talented players with uh, inferior skills get beat. It's not enough to be physically strong and have fast feet. Right? And if you if and you know how it is, right? Like all the all this all the all these different things. I'll, sometimes people don't believe it unless it rhymes. Okay, so I'll make it rhyme for everybody. Okay. <laughs> if you so have true. fast if you have fast feet with slow minds, get beat. 
All right. That'll make it stick for you. Okay. Fast, fast feet, slow minds get beat. And so like, I saw that number two was, I saw that, um, I saw that, that <clears throat> the best game plans didn't win. It was the teams that aligned with their game plan, the best that win. Mm. And that was where I kind of started to recognize what is now prop popularly called culture, right? Um, although obviously <clears throat> you and I are on the same page of this, it's a culture is a very different thing than how m most people in the performance art of doing culture are, are, are doing it. Um, yeah. And then the third thing I noticed is that uh, at least from a <clears throat> sports coach's perspective, and I was obviously in the world of football, but I saw it everywhere else. Um, this is 20 something years ago, right? And it's better, but it's still a long way away from where I think it needs to be is that um, there are few professions, there are few professions that get less coaching than coaches. Yes. I mean, and, and I don't mean clinics and like just talking no, peer to peers. Yes. I'm talking yes. coaching, observation. I'll put it this way. One of the questions I love to ask coaches, I love this question because it is something that requires us to answer it with thoroughness <clears throat> is if somebody coached you the way that you coach your athletes, would you get better at your job? Okay. Cause the answers are yes or no. If the answer is yes, I would get better at my job. If somebody coached me that way, <clears throat> my next question is, do you get that coaching then? Are you getting the kind of coaching that would make you as better at your job as you hope you're making your athletes? But if the answer is no, I wouldn't get better at my job if somebody coached me that way. My next question is, then why would you coach athletes like that? So if the way that we coach and the manner that we coach, like if that is important, then certainly it would be important to us. Like let's embody the standard that we are teaching and sometimes preaching at our athletes ourselves. And if we're not, let's acknowledge that. I don't want to get coached hard. I want to coach other people hard. I don't want to get barked at. I want to bark at other people. I don't want people to point out my flaws. I want to point out your flaws. Yeah. I had a problem with I had a problem with this when I played. I had a huge problem with this. Same and of so course, <laughs> I mean, of course, you know, at 19, you know, it's easy to talk about it now at 41, 42 here in a month, right? It's easy to talk about it at 42 with, you know, I got two kids and running a business and a mortgage. You know, I've got, you know, I'm I'm, I'm more mature than I was at 19, hopefully, slightly, <laughs> right? So at 19, I had my 19 year old experience of this recognition, <clears throat> and I just became on fire. I just like I, it, I was on fire for it absolutely on fire and um yeah that's where it started for me like this there's a lot of questions that I, and things i wrote down from that one of the things that i first thought about was don't most sport coaches think that if you're a coach if somebody's labeled as a coach but they don't actually work with athletes don't they instantly just like discredit them and don't think that they're actually a coach therefore they don't hire them is that why yeah it's kind of like anything else right i mean <clears throat> um the terms that people use and you know it's kind of like anything like it's like Justin. It's like it's like if somebody says best selling author now, does that mean something? Right. It used to. It used to. It doesn't anymore. So that's why like people are like oh you're you know you're a coach. I'm like eh, maybe, but you know it. I guess I look at this. I I respect you know anybody who's ever been in a locker room or a clubhouse, right? You have, I have. I respect what it means to be that kind of coach a lot. And it's just different than, yeah, do I coach now? Of course, of course I coach, right? But that's, I don't call myself a coach personally, right? Because I don't yeah. think there's a right or wrong on this. I just, I don't call myself a coach because to me, that is, right, not to overstate, but it's kind of like a sacred thing from like a locker room in the space, like that's how that. So I look at it more like, I think, I think, um, I think more in the advisor realm, but you are right. Like if, if we're not coaching athletes, um, in that fashion, or sometimes even, even coaching in the style of what historically coaches have looked like, people can start to undermine just that phrase. I, that's, that's just one of those things where it's like, I don't know, it's a personal preference that, you know, we're debating over what was that thing? Like, is, is this dress gold or is this dress blue? And it's like, <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot of important things to talk about. I, I find that that's not one that even if we resolved it would take us somewhere. I agree. And because you are a coach, because you provide valuable insight. And there's a reason that like you're at UW and you've been the places you're speaking because coaches are trying to chase that thing. Like you, you already said, you can't 
teach people how to love a game, but that's kind of what people hire you for. They, they want you to be able to help get through to athletes and like what has been some of the commonalities that you've noticed from all the different places that you've went and seen the success that you've seen, like success leaves clues. So what are the clues that you've seen? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I, I think this is one of those, <clears throat> I think this is one of those areas where, uh, I'll give you, I'll give you a good example. So I, I work with, I work with a, a lot of teams, work with a lot of coaches. And, and one of the things that, that I help coaches do is, you know, coaches are specialists in their, their, their field, right? They're specialists in their game. They're specialists at their level. And I, I, I learned a long time ago and accepted that because somebody is good at teaching uh, or crafting a game plan or teaching three technique or cover two, or, you know, a two, three zone or whatever, take your thing all the way out, right? Like they, they, you know, they know how to, they know how to, they know how to manage a bullpen. Um, it does not mean that they understand the details of what move human beings or that they know how to craft words in ways that like get people aligned. It doesn't mean they're great at building trust. I think one of the hard things is that, is that you might have a coach and this, I know this frustrates coaches, right? And and I don't even have to, you know, again, we, we, we don't know each other that well, but like, I know that this frustrates you because just because of the nature of the world that you're in, where, you know, you have the information and the plan and the system and the activity that would take somebody to the thing that they want, but they just won't do it. And it just won't get all the way on. And, and what we do when we are people who believe, you know, and I've got kids, so every parent understands what that is trying to lead our kids. And I think parents get frustrated because we think as coaches, man, I've got, I've got it. Just do what I say. Yes. And then what's the easiest thing to do? The easiest thing to do is not be patient and work hard and put ourselves in the, <laughs> basically to do all the things we tell athletes to do. The easiest yes. thing to do is command them. And when they don't do what we want, get mad. And so I'm going to go back to like from a commonality, it's I share that because one of the things that I do with coaches is I help them navigate those waters where they're like, this is what I want and this is what I am seeing. But I don't exactly know what that path like. You'd be shocked how many. I mean, I work with pro coaches in every sport. You'd be shocked how many professional coaches making millions are looking at their their locker rooms and saying, I don't know how to get them where I want to go. And I'm trying to figure this out right now, live. Because 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 why did a coach get into the game? They got in the game because they love the sport. Ooh, yeah. Right? That's why. Like, what does a coach – look at – look at so Chip Kelly, right? Buddy of mine, worked with him a long time. Look what he just did. Yeah. And look what he just he, said. He went down. Yeah. He left the head coach of a – I don't know what they are. Pac-12, Big Ten. <laughs> he, he was yeah, but... <laughs> right? like, awesome dude, like brilliant football mind. And he said it, right? He said it. I left because I wasn't able to get in the game and I want to go back to being in the game. So when you're a head coach now, you're having to do all these different things. And like, that's not the skill set that they were trained and raised in, in the industry. So I'm going to come back to this. The, 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 the commonalities are far less specific than we like to believe they are. We love to believe that there is a, we love to believe that there is a, uh, oh, I'll, I'll give you a really good example. And I was just sharing this with another coach. <clears throat> we talk about the process, right? It became popular because Saban said it, the process. Well, here's the problem with the process. Number one is the word the, singular. Number Ooh. two, number two is the word process. As if there is a sequential preset series of steps that you're just following that takes you where you want to go. And Justin, if that existed, I would charge more and everyone would do it and they would get where they want to go every single time. <laughs> it's not a process. It's a jungle. And you are trying to figure out like what direction should I go? And where should I go? And it, so the principles are like really big, like they're big, high level. And then there's like a thousand different styles and strategies and approaches and ways that you can do it. And I love it because, you know, for a while I would, I would kind of compare, like take, take, uh, uh, take Dabo Swinney, Urban Meyer, uh, Nick Saban, Kirby Smart, Ryan Day. 
are those guys the same kind of per- Jim Harbaugh? Are they the same kind Not of person? Not even a little bit. Nope. Do they do they do they do they all operate by the same exact standards? Do they follow nope. the exact same process? Do they have the same strategies? Do they like if if could you love playing for one of those coaches and absolutely hate playing for some of the other ones? Yes. So this sort of this sort of thing that I think coaches look for where it's like, show me the way or like, what's the thing all successful people have in common? Well, I, I don't know. Like Michael Jordan was kind of a dickhead. Shaq was super funny. <laughs> I don't think they would have gotten along. They're both hall of famers and won multiple championships. Like, yeah, I don't know. Like, so there's some things that, you know, even the, even discipline, like was Randy Moss the most disciplined guy? Probably not. But guess what? Like he had a level of talent that was so spectacular. Like the physics of life are you can afford a little less discipline if you have that talent. You just can't afford to be absent of it. Right. And so it's like we have these things that move. So I I share that because because there are there are not there are so few absolutes in this. So few absolutes. One of one of the absolutes is um you have to set and enforce standards. You must. And I, I, I say that because obviously it's just a must. Now, what standards you set and enforce, that's where there's like high variability. You can do all kinds of different stuff. One of my favorite coaches of all time, Frosty Westering. Yeah. Um, awesome, right? He, he, used, he used to give them, he used to, and I, and I, you know, talked to Frosty a ton when I was in college and I was kind of writing a thesis on who's coaching coaches and stuff and learned a bunch from him back in the day. And and he used to like take popsicle breaks at practice. And he had a rule where players would have to hold, you know this, he would have a rule. Like it was an absolute law in the program. In a game, if you were going onto the field or leaving the field, you had to be holding hands with a teammate. Because his belief was the connection and the bond and the relationship. You would have to literally hold hands. I would hate to see what Twitter would do with that today. I would hate. Oh my God. It'd be awful, right? <laughs> and it'd be ugly, right? Yeah. So, so it's like you know today, like would Nick Saban ever do that? No, right? But Frosty is one of the greatest football coaches to ever live, and so the standards, the 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 principles that drive quote unquote success or excellence would be a word that I would use, right? Because excellence is sometimes going seven and three after going three and seven. Like excellence is not championships. Excellence is in, in some part, a subjective thing compared to whatever the window of time you have available and who you are, um, the, the requirements are not absolute across the board for everybody. And so I think one of the things that we can do is ha- like have a discerning eye for don't try to copy a Nick Saban, understand the principle underneath it and, and lead from who you are by understanding the principle. And then our job is, is, apply the principle to, to your approach and your style. And, and you got to figure that out. Like it's not the process or frankly, even a process it's, it, it's so confusing. I, I refer to this as uh, leadership vertigo. I call this leadership vertigo. Ooh, anybody, who's mean, ever, okay, right? anybody, you know, like anybody who's ever led has leadership vertigo where you were trying to do something with a group of people and you get like halfway into the effort and you are lost. And you're like, I, I don't know if I'm doing the right thing right now. I don't know if I'm following the right principles. I don't know if I need to start over or continue. I'm not exactly sure. Like every leader has experienced leadership vertigo and we are going to experience it over and over and over again. If you're a parent, you've experienced parent vertigo. We are like, hold on a second. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure I've put my kid on a good path. I don't know if I'm taking them in the right way. Like I, it's just, you know, it's just part of leading human beings. So I think in today's world, we look for all these stuff and all these promises, and it's really hard to separate reality from what we see in all the content teaching this stuff because everybody says, this is the way, and our brains aren't built to, our brains aren't built to see all this stuff. And there's just an ocean of trash out there right now, just an ocean of it. And it, and it, you know, again, I'm not complaining, right, but I'm recognizing. And so trying to figure out the message through the noise right now is really difficult for for coaches i i i legitimately empathize with with coaches trying to figure out and who to trust who to follow who to listen to because there's just a lot of hucksters out there now there's the one thing that seemed to be the common way quote unquote for strength coaches and 
sport coaches to discipline their teams is mat drills. And no this doubt. is something that, right. And this is something that I just helped a coach in um, <clears throat> a Facebook group in the NSCA special interest group. Yeah. But it's, it's still rampant. Like, what do you see? I can tell that you you've talked about this subject. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, I, let's start from the highest level. Um, and we, we see this, um, you know, one, where did, where did mat drills and all that stuff? Like what's the, what's the origin of where all that got pulled from? And you can keep going back and back and back and back. Where did all that got pulled from? It got pulled from the military. Like that's where it all got pulled from is do this. And like coaches and other, you know, coaches aren't the only ones who do this, but they are, I, I would call them a, an egregious violator is they see something and they copy the most surface level version of it. Ooh. Right. So how often yeah. do they see a Navy SEAL training something? They see a video and they're like, I'm going to do that. And they don't have the first clue what the, it's not dissimilar to, it's not dissimilar to seeing something in a workout. How often does somebody see whatever an Instagram workout or whatever it is? And they're like, oh, I'm just going to copy what I saw. They don't understand the muscle it's trying to target. They don't understand the programming. They don't understand the load. Like They don't understand the frequency. They don't understand, you know, we'll talk here in a little bit about strength to expression of strength. Like they don't understand what that transference needs to look like so that they're actually building strength in a way that allows them to express that strength in a productive fashion. And they copy all this different stuff. So, so let's look at the highest level. Does a, does a physical train, does running and touching a line, this, this is one of the things that bothers me, right? This bothers me. <laughs> me too. And this bothers me, right? And this, this, this may insert, I don't know, but we'll see. This may insert some disagreement between you and I, which I'm not afraid of, right? But it's this, right? One of the things that bothers me is when I see this phrase, how you do anything is how you do everything. If you don't touch, I hate the, that line, if you don't touch the line, the drill, you're not going to blank in your life. And respectfully, respectfully, okay? If I hear a coach say that and he's 80 pounds overweight, it's over. It's over. I talk with these strength coaches about this all the time. Like like I was just talking with Sobel out in, out in San Diego State, uh, uh, you know, who is awesome is one of my dudes, right? And, and Ryan Davis out at, at, uh, uh, at, at Maryland, Matt Gildersleeve at Kansas. And, you know, these guys are dudes, right? Like they are in it. They are doing it. They are lifting, right? And, and so like this idea that if you don't touch the line in a drill, now listen, is attention to detail important on things? Yeah, of course it is. Of course, it's not denying that. But I don't parent my four-year-old daughter the same way that I talk to you. I don't, I don't uh, deadlift, right? I don't deadlift the same way I drive. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't eat, uh, I don't eat ice cream occasionally the same way that I uh, practice learning music. Like things change, context changes, attention, time, energy, intensity, like it changes all kinds of stuff. And so there are things in my life that need significant levels of discipline and attention to detail and precision. There are other things that do not like I speak for a living, right? I, 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 part of what I do is I speak for a living. I don't ever write out a speech. I write nothing. I have no canned speech. I don't write it out. I, I have the core things that I know that I want to say. And then I express, I talk, I share, you know, I've been doing this for like a long time. So I have a lot of stuff. I've got like a hundred of these notebooks of things that I've written down. And so, so when I do that, that way, that doesn't mean that I do every part of my life that way. That's how this particular environment works in this particular context. So, so what the reason I, I share that, right, is because, you know, we look at like mat drills, like, look, mat drills are really good, right? Mat drills are good for bonding. Mat drills are good. Like, what, what do we know? Going through hard things together is beneficial. Like, do it. Mat drills are obviously good for, you know, physical uh, 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 you know, getting in shape and doing like, you know, moving around, doing different, like they're good for the things that they're good at, but doing mat drills is not going to give a team a great culture any more than, any more than putting Navy SEALs through, uh, uh, buds and a hell week is going to turn them into great war fighters. It's a, it's a, did you know that all the instructors for buds have to complete a basically a two year male psychology PhD before they're allowed to be a buds instructor? I did not. Yeah. So anybody who's a buds instructor spends two years of training relational, behavioral, psychological, and emotional patterns of obviously in this world, it's men, right? Of men yeah. before they're allowed to be a buds instructor because buds and hell week 
is a highly choreographed, highly staged testing environment for them to weed out people who are mentally, emotionally, relationally not capable of doing the things required of a Navy SEAL. And they teach and they train through it, but they put them through every test. And what they do is, and what they do is, you know, you get 225 guys in the buds class, like 20 to 25 pass. It's a 90% fail rate, 10% success. What they do is they, they don't go in and try to, to make sure everybody fails. They go in and they say this, <clears throat> they, they do try to make you fail. Okay. Obviously, because they have to test you all the way, but, but what they do is they coach you through that. They, they don't want you to fail, but they're going to try to make you because they want to figure out like, can you figure something out on your own? Can you take a little coaching? And so, but they do it in this, in this highly, highly, highly disciplined and intentional fashion. They are not putting them through physical tests. They are using physical tests to put them through psychological, emotional, and relational tests. They just use a physical environment to do it. And what I think coaches miss is they think it's just brute force. It's just, let's just overload and overwhelm the system and we'll see who taps out. Well, the Navy SEAL is like, no, no, no. We're going to put them in this scenario and in this spot. I'll give you one example of like what, how they do it um, and how it's not a physical thing so much as the mental thing. Obviously, they are going to test the physical load. Like, you know, like if I'm going to go through it and they're like, look, if you can't carry a boat and I put this thing on you and your shoulders can't take it, you're going to, you're going to wash out. You got to be able to carry the load, right? That's why, that's why, you know, it was like females in that. It's like, well, yeah, but if a, if a female can't carry a 230 pound guy or can't do all of this different stuff, it breaks. It's no different than if me at 165 pounds right now can't do that. It's no different, right? Like whatever, I'm 5'9", 165. So like I might not have the physical ability to be a Navy SEAL, okay? But they'll do things like, like you know, say you're training or, or a, a very specific story one of the guys talked to me about where they, they would, two of them I think are really interesting. One, during hell week, they would, and if it wasn't every night, they did it at least a few times. Looking to expand your education further, but you don't want to pay the massive fees of going back to school? At Strength Coach Network, we have two long-form education courses that both cost less than one course taught to you by an online school. If you click down below to learn more about Fundamentals 1 or Fundamentals 2, you will be able to sign up for our education course that has over 20 hours of educational content brought to you by some of the biggest names in the field. Dr. Brian Mann, Zach Daykant, Jeff Moyer, Terrence Kennel, and many more inside of this course all for less than the price of one course at a college university is, you know, you're, you're, you know what, you know, this how we great, you ever seen, right? You're laying in the sand, you're carrying the logs, you're, you know, somebody put it out. It's like the equivalent of running like two to three marathons a day for seven straight day. Like it's like, you know, whatever that, I mean, just whatever running one marathon a day for seven days would be enough. Right. So it's just this like brutal physical test, but it's, but at, at when the sun would set in Coronado, they would take all the guys up on the berm and the, the little berm that they would put these kind of, they had these sand mounds and they would sit them down. And as the sun was just setting, like not just below the water, like not the beautiful portion, but the portion where like the light was leaving. And it went from like, there was lightness showing to gray and starting to get dark. And they would sit them up, they would have to lock arms. And then they would have to sing some silly song about whatever, goodbye sun, hello night, whatever, it didn't matter. But they didn't have any physical test. And they would make them sit there for five minutes, maybe 10 while singing. And maybe they were spraying them with water or whatever. More guys quit during that five to 10 minute window than anything else. More guys sat there and, and think about this. More guys sat, cause here's what they understood. When you're running and you're carrying a log and you're carrying a boat and water's coming over you, sand's all in your thing and you're having to cross, scratch and climb, what's going on in your mind while you're doing all of that? Like you're occupied with the task, the energy from your mind and your brain and your emotions is going into survival, get through, carry my guy, compete, whatever. Your mind is occupied with stuff. Well, here's what they understand. If we just stop occupying your mind with that stuff, your mind has to start supplying its own story. And when the mind starts to apply its own story, guess what guys would consider? How many more days? What do I have to do? Do I really want this? I could just walk away. This is nice. They're going to ask me to get back in the water. Do I want to get back in the water? Am I ready? What's that going to feel like? And their mind attacked them from the inside. And guys would just get up, walk over, ring the bell. 
So, so they like they did it on purpose because they're like, look, we're gonna occupy you, occupy you, occupy you, occupy you, make it awful. Then we're gonna give you five minutes for you to destroy yourself. Let's see if you're strong enough to resist the voice in your own head. And most Ooh. guys are not. Most guys are not. So they do that. Second thing they would do is, is they find each guy, each instructor, every guy identifies what are you most good at? What is your number one talent? So if you and I ran that, they're like, what's Justin? What is he unbelievable at? What's the thing that he does so well? What's the thing BK does so well? And they talk about it, they choreograph it, and they scheme it. And then they come up with and devise plans to remove your ability to do that for the next 24 <laughs> hours or 48 hours. So here was a crazy one, ready? One guy's talent was his leadership and his relational ability and his ability to go do things for his team. So here's what they did to him. They locked him in the bunkhouse. This is not during Hell Week. This is during Buds. They locked him in the bunkhouse. And they wouldn't let him participate in the drills with the team that he was leading. And they made, he, they made the team go out and perform and do everything for a week without him being involved. They literally let him sit in there. And they said, you don't get to come out today. And they made him watch. I was going to say, did he have to listen? And or not, like, Yeah, oh. he had to watch and look and not participate. And it crushed him. And he was getting ready to quit. And then his team went in and they had these like, uh, they have these, they have these like uh, cages where they put all their, swimming gear and 